It was, it was an experience that I'll, that I would say would be forever, and it's, and it's sometimes it's, a, it's both a, uh, both a plus and a curse at the same time because you're constantly thinking like you're with folks. Currently, I work for ABC News. Uh, what I do there is I, uh, I'm a contributor. So anytime there's, uh, there's any kind of uh, active shooter, homicide investigation, gang robbery thing going on, they call me and I go on the air. Uh, it's a great gig. Uh, you don't have to be anywhere Monday at every, every other day at Monday at eight o'clock. It really works out really well. I also have a TV show. It's called, uh, it's not only mine, it's mostly the detectives who do the job. It's called New York Homicide. It's on the Oxygen Channel. And what we do is we talk about cases that we went through, all solved, all things that we did. It shows you kind of like how we, how to work these cases and the drive and the initiative that's necessary and the grit. So I'm going to talk about a lot of that just now, um, exactly how that happens and what you do. Um, so 35 years, about five years since we've worked for ABC since this TV show is in its second season now. Uh, so all things are going good. All things are clicking except for this weather. Anyway, so this is a, this is something that's most extreme working on homicide case. And someone in this room knows it as well as I do. It's no, there's nothing more important that you can be tasked with in the NYPD is investigating homicide. Uh, so you have to, a lot of things to deal with. You really have to know what you're doing. Was one mistake and the perpetrator walks, but we never find him. And that's the problem. We've seen this last week with Gilgo. Um, had they done something a little bit different, they probably would have identified this guy a little sooner. We'll soon see, hopefully we'll, 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 we will see, if that, uh, if that didn't, no one was killed by this individual. Uh, but things matter if you make a little mistake. It's that tight, and that's what you want to do with the team. There's no one person who solved the crime in the NYPD, or anywhere else for that matter. Very happy that my colleague, uh, Rodney Harrison, went out to Suffolk, a great man. Um, he was chief of detectives after me, and, um, and then became chief of the department. So he actually got, did, did better than me. But uh, he's doing a great job now, and that's what's important. So uh, about two months into his tenure, he actually, they actually figure out the purpose, which is amazing to me. I will take all questions you want to ask me about Gilgo. You should ask me about Idaho State. Four murders out there at the school did really something, really great police work. And there's something called case discipline. And in both in both times, in both cases, there was no leak to the press. A leak to the press can, can send your uh, your perp out on a on a spree, you know, so never see him again or her again. So you really have to keep it tight, and they did in both of these cases. And I admire them for it. I was walking out of bed, I think uh, Thursday or Friday, what it was last week, they got him, they made a collar on the Gilgo Beach murder murderer. So I was surprised about it. I knew they were close, but I didn't know they were that close. So good news. And one, one thing, you, you look at both cases, uh, Brian Colbert, or I think his name is in Ohio State, and this, this fellow here, Rex Hewerson. Um, you look at each individual, and they're completely different each time. Serial, murder, serial murderers that aren't the same. And there's no profile on that that can describe either one. If anybody fit the, that, that FBI profile, it would have been Colbert. Was he's that incel, what they call it, in military cell, but he was the nerd, the, the outsider, never, never, never had a social life. These particular, this particular guy did, he had a wife and kids. So he just goes to show you, you can, you can twist this thing up with science all you want, it doesn't always mean it's gonna be right. So that's the whole thing. Each, curve, each case deserves your utmost respect and attention. Once you get to the point where you take the some of your, your victim is, uh, is someone who is, uh, gang member or his lifestyle contributed to that, to that demise, you're on a slippery slope. It's really gonna affect your investigation. But you won't be a good, you won't be a good homicide uh, back to this for sure. Um, so I understand, you know, this is the same course I give to the NYPD. For the most part, I'll modify it a little bit. So I'm gonna explain some of the things we do. But I still teach in the academy. I teach this course, a homicide course, um, in the police academy three times a year. So well, this is basically the same material. Some of the cases I had that, that, uh, that we worked through, the subject matter of this stuff is really terrifying. Um, you have to really stand outside of it to understand it. Because if you if you bask in it, you think for too long, it will affect your uh, your thinking. And you can't do that. This is terrible work. And those who do it have to understand that you need that professional detachment from really from, from the victim and the victim's family. The victim's family is really important uh, because they can help you solve the crime. They're going to hear things that you're not hearing. So it's really important to understand that that you need to be plugged into them. Um, you can ask me questions anytime. This thing. I, you know. <laughs> I was I was very fortunate in my career to be a precinct commander. Um, and, you know, for six years, I also uh, uh, a division commander, and then a 
detective bureau permitted twice. And with the chief of detectives, I had to do, deal with the press all the time. So I'm used to getting asked questions. I always say the only bad question is one you don't ask. All right, so I understand that. I'm no, I have no problem with it at all. Uh, attention to detail, which I talked about. You're gonna, you have to ask yourself when you get there. First, you got to identify the, the victim of homicide. That's not easily done. It's not always happens that way. You see, we still have unidentified victims in Gilgo. Uh, we're moving forward towards that. Um, we're doing well with that, with, uh, with uh, familial DNA testing, which we got on one of the cases I'm going to talk about today. All right, and it's probably the biggest case I had, the most, most media case I had. And we did a version of it on the on New York homicide. It's the murder of Karina Vitrano in Howard Beach, Queens. So understand that you got, uh, it's a, it's a, it was a rigorous case. I was told we would, uh, we, we would never solve it. My detectives did solve it. And it's, it's something to talk about that you just never give up. If you think in your, in your own mind that you will not solve a case, you won't. It's as simple as that. You stay with it and you don't make mistakes. All right. And sometimes what Rodney said the other day about fresh eyes on things, that, that matters. There was a mistake there that not a lot of people know about. The mistake was that the individual who saw uh, on the last case, the reason we do patterns is that if you put people in a pattern, three, this is a four case pattern in Gilgo Beach. You solve one of them, you solve all of them. That's what's important to understand. All you need is a break on one case, so which they got. Amber Lynn Costello, her boyfriend saw him. Hey, listen, the boyfriend, whatever he was, saw him and could identify the perpetrator. Not only that, gave them the car. Even better, the car was a very, very distinctive car. All right, so you're off to the races on that. What happened in 2011 was they ran the car in the, in the database as a, as a truck. It's not a truck, it's a passenger. Um, and they should have run it every which way from Sunday because that's how you make that. So what the FBI gave them in 2011 was those two boxes in the Manhattan, which is really tough, really, because there's so many phones, there's so many people there, and it gave them Mass Eagle Park. Um, that's a good playing field to work on. So had you had that, um, that car, if you knew if that person was a Mass Eagle, you would have went to the house and you, would, you had your subject ID almost immediately. They didn't do that because they ran it as a truck. If you look at it, it's, it you run in everything. Commercial run every which way, let's say keep running it until you get a break. Additionally, what we would have done in the NYPD, and we have more resources in Southern County, that's for sure. But what we did, we did a grid search for that car. And we would, I, would, I would have searched all the best people for that car. And what we found it was just sitting right in front of his house, bringing that much. So mistakes are made uh, in every human endeavor. I made it, that's for sure. Um, unfortunately, in this endeavor, you can't. It's almost like investigation because he will kill again. So when you got that break in the last one, Amber was the last one that we have in this pattern uh, to find out who he is. Now, is that when you go, sometimes you go to a DA with your witness, and the witness isn't always up to snuff. It, it could be a criminal themselves, it could be a drug dealer, it could be whatever, um, but you have to go with that person. So they'll ask for more. In today's world, and I will tell you, it is better to have a case that's a lot of circumstantial evidence that, that has technology and science in it, than an eyeball uh, witness. Eyeball witnesses are, are drilled by the press. Um, there could be human error there. All kinds of things. If you assemble enough evidence, and we'll go through this stuff, if you assemble enough DNA, which is, which is going faster than anything else, DNA evidence, and you go forward, you do your phone work, you're gonna, you're gonna solve the case. Or you, you're really gonna have a stronger case. Even if you have someone who can ID the shooter, the stab, or whatever, you still need to do that work. You still need to do his phones. You still need to do his, uh, what he's searching on in open source. All these things can contribute to make a stronger case. And that's where we are right now. So the one witness IDs, that's the thing of the past now. You can get so much more information if you, if you know what you're doing. That's what task forces give you. You look at a task force, you have analysts on board. Detectives, those are some of the best detectives in New York City, have skill sets that don't brought into technology. So you need to bring in special people to help you with the case. They did that in Southern, which is really good. So, that, so that's where we we'll, we'll start with the crime scene. Those first responders to the job, those first cops jump out of radio car, they're usually kids, because the young people out on, throughout the job now, they get out of the car and they, they identify the crime scene. Sergeant comes and helps them do it. The bigger, the better. This way you, you can always, it's, it's, you can always shrink it. If you grow it, you're gonna miss something. You're gonna have a poison crime scene. So make it big. And I'll explain that further as we go into the presentation. Um, in something inside, like Idaho State, that was really, really tight. You know, I always say, look for the mistake of the problem. They all make them. 
whether it's hot blood or cold blood. Hot blood means it's a spare of the moment thing. What's supposed to happen? Robbery, sexual assault, you know, fight, whatever the case may be. Cold blood, planned murder. Could be greed, could be anything. So you make more mistakes in hot blood than you do in cold blood. And you should be able to determine that just by the circumstance. Next, the next thing you do is get that motive. That motive may change. You can't stand on a hill with it, but you can. You should be able to pivot in regards. So that, that thing changes all the time, but it usually comes the same what's going on in that person's life. It's a gang member, it's probably gang related, and you can figure that out almost immediately. If there's trouble at home, it could be domestic violence, it could be anything. These particular girls, they were in tough business. The sex workers in, 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 um, in um, sex workers in um, in uh, in the area, New York, Long Island, New Jersey. The girls out there were college girls in high school. So you have stark differences, but I'm going to show you some parallels with each one. All right. I said we made some mistake. Colbert, what did he do? Do we know? What, what turned the case? Left the knife. There you go. Knife chief. Thank you very much. K9 uh, knife over. It's a Rambo knife. Left that chief there in his rage, the sheath in his rage, and they got that that uh, DNA right from the top from that bottle. All right, now, now you got an example. Right? You got a profile. You know who he is. Now you got to find out who he is. But you also find out that uh, he walked through the crime scene. One of the people saw him inside. They were able to identify him somewhat. So exactly what happened in in, in uh, Hillgo Beach. Couldn't give a hundred percent, but you can give something of him. And now you're off with a white car. You see him get into a white car. Now you go crazy with a white car. We have so much technology out there with plate readers and, and, and uh, close, uh, close circuit TV. We're going to pick up that car somewhere. What they didn't know then, he was 10 miles out. I got to tell you, and, uh, I particularly like the Idaho State case because it was, it was a, a perfect investigation. He had a guy who looked like you know the chief there. Um, I mean, the media was calling him Santa Claus. He had a long white beard, all kinds of stuff. And kind of like saying it wasn't up to his chest. But the first thing he did was ask people to come in. He built his, he built his team. He brought in the state police and he brought in the FBI. The FBI has things that normal police is done, police departments don't have, even the NYPD. No one crunches numbers better than the FBI. You've got to bring them in. They come in, they're great people. Despite what you're seeing in Washington, I'll tell you the, the officers, the um, case agents in the field, tremendous, they work right next to you. All right, so have some faith in that, that's for sure. So get to the crime scene, understand the crime scene. Is that you got to pick up on every little thing that's been meticulously done because everything matters now, everything. The littlest thing. We, we solve crimes by looking at a video, and uh, we see a perp shoot somebody, go down the stairs, touch the stairs like this on the way down. And we show that to the crime scene tech, go back and get a fingerprint, and get the DNA swap. Now we know what purpose. He's in the, if he's in the system, these particular people who are not in the system think he'll go and uh, not have stay. So that was, there was the dilemma there. You have something. I'm going to talk about one of my cases to the same thing. I had this DNA profile, I don't know who it was. I think about finding it, which is the hard part. It takes time. But it's due diligence that you have to do. So this, it's really important. And I can't stress the uh, enough of it. You know, there's all this stuff about inductive reasoning and Sherlock Holmes and deductive reasoning, all things like that. It's really easy to figure out. Inductive is when you stand there and make note of everything. Deductive is when you figure out his life and put the two together. It's really easy stuff. But the people make a lot of money doing that. Um, deploy your technology immediately. Get people out there. Usually I found the younger the cop, that we hire, the better they are technology-wise. So that's all, that's all part of it, too. Uh, I talked about cold blood. Partners with other agencies. Um, in my time, I was very fortunate. I worked for uh, Ray Kelly. He promoted me four times, God bless him. Uh, but Bill Bradley gave me the big job, gave me chief of detectives. Uh, and then Ray Kelly would never bring outside task forces in. Bill Bradley and Bobby signed as many as one. So I, did, I think of it, we did about 10 in different crimes everywhere we had to tackle gangs, you know, not so much homicide, but tackle gangs, cyber crime, uh, human uh, trafficking, all these things. That's what lowered the thing in New York City. You know, it was 2017, 2018, the best years we had, we had the lowest numbers ever since like the 1940s, before the war. Uh, we had South Carolina was going until a certain mayor from a young girl there. But uh, it's kind of screwed things up, changed the police department. <laughs> so, so that's what happened. Um, we were very fortunate to bring in these partners. Um, so the first party you have on the home side is the enemy. You bring in, they, they take the body, they take what's on the body, the clothing, everything else, and they examine the body. And so they'll tell you they develop what's home side, whether you have a case or not. But you don't know when you don't know. If someone's laying there, you, duh, 
on a, on a strangulation, usually the hyoid bone is, is fractured. And then this way you know you have a suffocation, asphyxiation. She was strangled or he was strangled to death. They'll tell you that and now you, now you got a homicide. Without them saying it's a homicide, you can't take a case on it. It's not a case, but you need that. They're gonna ask for more and more, more and more information from you. You go out and give it to them. What you really can't do, is, unless he tells you that or she tells you that. And they're great in New York City, they really are. There's a lot of them here, there's a lot of Nassau County, just saying Nassau County, there's some excellent people, uh, pathologists who really work very hard and work with us um, hand in hand. And again, with the presentation, we'll go through that. So that's one of them. Uh, the DNA recovery is up to them, they hold the DNA. They, they, we give them the, uh, um, the material, they develop the profile, they hold on to it, they send it to CODIS, which is a national database, both state and national. If you're not a CODIS, then we have to go find out who it is. Um, many times I would call uh, the DA, ask them to shut down the lab. I needed a profile to pick case. Can you develop one? It's a lot of work. Uh, we're getting better and better as, as technology goes forward. So that's important as well. Um, the FBI, what can they give us? That crime lab in Quantico is, is the best in the, uh, the nation, the best in the world probably. They have data crunching that we can't do. Um, so we, I had a case in Brooklyn, <coughs> Queens, a man named George Ray. George was a great guy. He was a Caribbean male. He came to the country early in his life. He worked hard. He, he, struck, he bought several houses. He was the American dream personified. He goes to one of his houses and he's renting out and he sees a box. There, on the box, there's no postage on it. It looks like it was delivered by UPS, but there was no postage marks. He couldn't determine what it was. It was sitting there for two days. George opened it and it exploded in his face. It uh, killed him two days later. It took all the skin off his body and died from infection. It was a terrible crime. When I got to the scene, it was, it was right up to Pell Park last, Pell Parkway as you go through Southeast Queens. Um, looked at the thing and I saw the names written on it. It was addressed to an individual and it had a return address of a sergeant who was a friend of mine, Mark Smith. And he actually worked for me in the 6th Avenue Precinct. And it was a tough case, what's going on here? Do a little, little work on the person he, he sent it to was a police officer who worked in the 6th Precinct. This was attempted murder of a police officer. It blew up into a big case, as it should have been. But we didn't know who, this, who sent this. There was no prints on it on that we could develop. It was a victim activated uh, bomb with an electrical um, electric device. As soon as you pull open it, it exploded on it. It had like fireworks, black powder. So it was incendiary, it burned the skin, and that's how he died. It was a terrible death. What to do? You don't have a lot. The, uh, there was no video on the block at that time. They see where the car was, it was sitting there for two days. So it was a tough case. But we looked into the lives of the officer. Went through everything, and I was once the CO at 6 7 for four years, longer than I was in high school. And I tell you what, I knew the priest pretty well. And um, drilled down on it, talked to the officer. And we think it was someone he arrested, but we didn't know. So I had to crunch, why did they get to the address? Because that address, the cop didn't live there. It was the wrong address that came up on the computer search on this police officer. And he had a distinctive name, which helped. We drilled down on that name, and uh, we finally found uh, an individual that we liked. So I had to call in the feds to help me do that, because I don't have that data process either, they do. So the JTTF came in and helped us solve the crime. We identified the perpetrator. It turns out that the officer and his partner had arrested him for, uh, I think it was possession of a, uh, a stun gun. And uh, at night he was riding around on a bicycle, which is pretty ominous in and of itself. Um, when we took his door, he had 15 other bombs that were to In fact, he had the names of police officers on each one. We probably, probably saved a couple people's lives that way because you had the courage and you had the, the, the less of an ego to bring in help, bring in the feds, and we were able to turn the case. So it's, it, there's, a, there's a brotherhood among law enforcement and um, a paternal feeling that no matter where you work, you're all in the same game. So as I said, the FBI's going, the FBI's going through hard times right now. You know, we always liked them, always needed them, any, any time I could get them, I used them. So they, they really helped in that case, and others, they helped in this case, because no one does uh, phones like the FBI. Hi, man, come on in. So uh, that's, that's my point on the FBI. I mean, you get as many people you, as you get, because, it gets, because they're gonna help solve the crime. Now, going back, they have all terrorism cases, the FBI. So we help them, I show up on the scene, the NYPD has the ability because someone once said we're the like 15th world, world's uh, largest standing army on this show. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> uh, but we can put a lot of people on a corner in a hurry. So we had, in my time, it's my tenure as chief detective, so there was three terrorist incidents I was there. 
Um, and each time we were put a lot of people out there. One of, one of my detectives in Manhattan did better than anybody, they get video. We had pictures of the perp in each one of those cases um, that helped get right to the FBI. We helped them as well. This is all keeping everybody safe, and that's what it's all about. You know, um, one guy was uh, our friend, uh, Conrad uh, Hammy. He uh, exploded a bomb in September, in September of 2016 and injured 30 people. We almost three of them critical, thank God they lived. He, he was on a bombing tear. He exploded a bomb the previous day in Jersey and we exploded another one that night in Jersey. And one thing I remember talking to, I, and you, sometimes you, you get into this paradigm where you're, it's always the same. If, it, if we're gonna get the perp, he's gonna give it up and we'll lock him up, we'll take a door and he'll be on the other side of it. So I asked John Miller at the time, was the uh, chief of counterterrorism, he goes, no, Bob, this guy's gonna shoot out with us. He's on, he's on his break. He did shoot out with, uh, with the place in, um, in uh, Elizabeth, New Jersey, I think it was. They shot him four, 14 times. Uh, he did not die. Down in, uh, in Maxson, Colorado. Uh, now right now sitting in itself. So, but that's what can happen. You shot two police officers too. When you're dealing with one person, a criminal, and then you're dealing with a terrorist, a whole different set of rules, and you have to understand that too. So, like I said, the, the FBI has been really good to me, and, um, and we saw a lot of cases together, as well as other agencies. People have resources, and we have to understand that. So let me uh, you get into the presentation a little bit. So, you know why. Okay, technology is a homicide investigator. Smarter, faster, and stronger than the perpetrators. What does that mean? Bench pressing now. Means you gotta be able to, you gotta be able to understand that you have to work for long hours at a time, sometimes three, four days in a row, and you have to be strong. You go home, shout, have a bite to eat, and come right back to work. You can't walk away from that. That's what I mean by strength. Faster. You gotta get that evidence support of this virus. Especially video evidence. And any other kinds you you saw where the um, DNA was uh, was eroded from nuclear DNA to mitochondrial DNA in the uh, is it Gilgo Beach thing. It's because it was sitting outside. We didn't know where the bodies were at the time. So that's faster, smarter. Every perp make a, makes a mistake, find the, find the mistake, and arrest the bad guy. That's what that's about. I just said, talked about a collective effort. Not one person, not one person solves the case, no matter what type of does it, there's other people involved. Uh, so, it's in bosses as well. Technology, you don't have to have grasp on DNA technology or any of these things. Um, you don't have to have expertise in grasp. You have to know what it can bring you in the case, what kind of evidence it can bring you. So that's what that's about. Understanding that you don't have to be an expert, but you should know what you're talking about. And because I, I tell you, you will be the one on trial testimony, this is Dr. Allen Wilkie. You will be the one at trial by yourself if you're the case officer, explaining all these things with today. It's not easy. And you have the defense attorney to bring, kind of knock you down everything you say. So you have to have grasp of the entire case. When someone from crime scene gives you this, ask them to explain it. This way you figure it out exactly what it means to the case. Uh, forensics, all the same team, ask the United States uh, crime scene. Uh, strongest of all the disciplines, the most, most completely uh, sought through is DNA, is how we do things now. And that's what you have to think about as well. Um, news media could be friend or foe. I'm a friend, but not everybody in the media, news media is friends, all right? Um, they can ruin your case and spoil it but they can also put out information for you to help you solve it. So you have to understand that. So I always try to let the keep detectives away from the media and let them do their case. It's hard to do because in New York, uh, and, and something like this is, is just a, Gilgo is just amazing. So this is uh, two months into my, <coughs> my tenure as Chief of Day. It's uh, the end of May, things are going well. Enjoying my new job, set up my team. Things will go well, but the old place has come back to you. 75 Precinct in East New York, Brooklyn. I don't know if everybody's familiar with it. I was there twice. I was a sergeant there in the detective squad. I was also a captain down downstairs. I know it pretty well. Next door is the 73 Precinct. I was there twice as well. You see a pattern here. They keep sending me to the same places. So I, I tell you what, it's the best, the best, the best, because that's where you needed the most. And you know those people need you. So it's important that you go there. And that's Crownsville, Brooklyn, next door. So sergeant and uh, lieutenant. Um, again, I wanted to be there. So this is a case of, this is a terrible uh, murder of, uh, of Prince Joshua the Lido, or what first we get to Tanya Copeland. Uh, May 30th, 2014, quarter of Stanley and Linwood. 
It's right outside the Boulevard houses in the Linden houses. If you go a little bit down the road, there's the Pink houses. Usually these places are all over the news. You should, and if you know anything about the city, you know where they are. People growing up in a very challenged environment. There's a lot of violence there, a lot of gangs, a lot of drugs. Um, so that night I get a call. It's an individual, Tanya, uh, 18 years old. She, she, her, the joy of her life was in a marching band. She was in a marching band. She had all she was devoted to. She was stabbed 30 times on the street with a knife. Um, and I'll show you the crime scene in a minute. And um, first time you think is rage. That's why you have to pivot. You have to understand that what you think is from your prior experience may not be true. So the first thing we think is it's a rage killing, someone she knew and really hated and wanted to kill her. That's what we all thought. Did she have a boyfriend? Did she have other friends who didn't like her? Who knows what? But we were still solve, trying to solve that crime. When two days later, this was a Friday night, on a Sunday, these two little kids, these two babies, were outside, six and seven year old, outside the boulevard houses. Um, Prince Joshua Vito, six years old, they were playing, and they went up to get ISIS upstairs in the apartment, in the um, housing project. And as they were in the elevator, a male was in there with them. And as kids do, they're joking around, having a good time. This individual takes out a knife and stabs them both. Stabs Joshua to death. Actually, Michaela should have died. Should have died, but they saved her life. The uh, EMS and then the doctor afterwards. Uh, we were able to save her. So now, I get to the scene. I know about Tanya. I know about these two kids. I had a serial stabber in Brooklyn. It's a problem. Right. Two months into my tenure, and then I have to understand exactly what I have to do. <clears throat> we flip a switch. We'll send 60, 70 detectives to that area, and I just talk to everybody we can about this individual. We didn't have to go that far. We had some very courageous people who stepped, who, uh, stepped up for us, for us. This is 845 Skank Boulevard, Skank Avenue, and the Boulevard houses at 75. You see that long walkway there? That's where the um, uh, Michaela came running out. But first, the perpetrator ran out. And every, there's benches right at the foot of those things where you see them down here. No old ladies on warm summer evening just sitting on the benches. They're all taking care of their kids. They're taking care of everybody's kids for that matter. They see this big fellow walk out, run out of there, all right? And he jumps that fence and he goes on the side of the building and he slips and falls because the grass was wet. And they start laughing. No, look at this big guy, run like an idiot, and he slipped and fell. Ha uh ha. -huh. So seconds later, Mikhail comes out. She's bleeding from her neck. She, uh, he said she lost a lot of blood. And now it's pandemonium. We take her to the hospital. We, we, they save her life eventually. She's in the hospital for weeks and weeks. We go to the uh, elevator and there's Prince Joshua Vito dead on the floor. It's terrible. And I got three murders in two days. All right, and um, it, it's, we start putting out things. The ladies on the bench explain everything to us. They tell us where he fell. We go over and we find a knife. We find a knife where he dropped as he was running. And the crime scene takes it and they do it. They, they, they combed the knife with, with specialized material, uh, material, and they were able to get as much as they can from it. We were able to develop that into a DNA profile. You don't always get that in these cases, but they did a great job. Send it to the, the uh, you know, CME, and we're all to brace it on that. These are the two murder weapons. This is the one the one on top is Tanya Copeland, Tanya Copeland. The one on the bottom is, um, is uh, Prince Joshua Vito. Look at them. The same knife. It's one of those knives you buy. Those steak knives. If you, you get, if you get a year out of them, you're lucky. I say all the time. This, this particular individual was using this to stab people. We get also a sketch. We're going to go back to the sketch a few times. Sketching on purpose has been done for about 100 plus years. All right. We have three sketch artists in the NYPD. They earn their pay every day. That's important to understand that as well. Um, so we get the sketches. It's a visual. Chubby guy. Half an afro type of guy, you know, big face. Uh, the problem with that looks like a lot of guys in East New York. And they were chasing people who resembled that down. The whole neighborhood was, was, was behind us on this. If they saw anybody like that, they were, they were grabbing people, holding them for us, and we were right at the end. That's how, that's how plugged in the neighborhood was and how registered were. So this is, uh, that's happened so Sunday, Monday night. This guy right here, homeless man is stabbed. And the first thing the homeless guy says to us, because we put this picture out, all over the news, front page. Brooklyn Killer, Brooklyn Stabber, all right? So this guy is stabbed up by this guy on the left, that individual right there, this is my killer right there, all right? Um, not, a, not, a, not a close horse by any, by any means, but something that in the, in the summertime, everybody's, walk, everybody's walking around like that, all right? We have something more than we had before. 
but he didn't kill the homeless guy. But the first thing the homeless guy said, this is the guy you're looking for, I read the papers. Thank you, sir. So now, <coughs> flipping switches all the way. See, that's in Manhattan on 18th Street. He's using the subways to make his way around the city. We still don't know who he is. A day later, Tuesday night, we get a call from the Emmy. We got a hit in CODIS. This is this fellow right here. His name is Daniel St. Hubert. That's his jailhouse photo on the, on, the, on the left. That's what he looked like when he was released. Pretty close, right? Not bad. Not bad. It was a good one. Um, and now we're, we're flipping switches all over the place. It's Tuesday night going into Wednesday. I'm in the PC's office with, with the mayor. We have people all over the street. I have I had everybody out but the Mountain Patrol. That's how many people we had out there. So we knew he lived at one time in Howard Beach or, or South Ozone Park, which is right next to each other. So we were going back and forth. He was popping out. He didn't understand phones because he did nine years in jail for stabbing his mother. Stabbing mom. Problem with what he did, he took a determined sentence, which means you can't, you have to be given uh, parole when you get that, your time is up. Nine years, he gets parole, but he can't go through a uh, parole board because he pled to it. It's a determined sentence. Now, I don't have any lawyers here, but they should rewrite the law. Uh, so this guy gets out with any kind of review. While he's in jail, he steps the people up. He's a killing machine. And he's out in the streets of, of Brooklyn. Never should have happened, but it happens every day now, by the way. It happens even worse. Um, so Daniel said, here, we're looking for him. Um, so now he pops as we're monitoring his phone. He pops in South Ozone. Go in the air. Who's, who do we have? What resources do we have in South Ozone Park? We have two cops from uh, Taro over there. We're doing work on this case. The only two we got. Taro is Tactical Assistance Response Unit. They're the experts with, with, uh, with tracking phones, getting video, stuff like that. So you really don't know how experienced they are in takedown, slacking some guy up, but he's out there. They see him write this, kills I will. Brooklyn, that's BK, he's a Brooklyn killer. He's got a little wink and a smile. He's writing that on a back of a stop sign as they can get him. Turns out, good news, both cops were uh, members of the football team, the MPB football team. I, I, I called one, I had his phone number, and I called him, I said, listen, he goes, what do you want to do? What's your just wait? I said, oh, crap. And he goes, what well, if he turns to shoot him? I said, yeah, shoot his ass. I don't care what, he's not getting away, not killing anybody else. So, uh, they, so they turn, they lock him up, and uh, inside his pocket, well, that's him right there, Daniel St. Rubin, St. Hubert, excuse me. Um, that's Mike North Singh and, um, and Mark Crooks from the 75 Squad walking about. He wasn't crazy enough that he didn't shave his head in the middle of prison cameras. So we use that to make the trial as well. So because of that, when we go to his house, we find out where he's living, this is what we find. He's our guy. He's our guy. We don't see him around anymore. Michaela Cavins wouldn't testify against him. Put him in jail. So he's doing, I think, about 40 to life. Problem is, we didn't have enough DNA on the, on the knife on Tanya. That's where she was killed. To lock him up for Tanya Coleman. Hopefully now, as the DNA gets better, we'll be able to lock him up with that on as well. So that's an unsolved crime that he did. We know he did it um, because it was the same night. But that's the tale of that. Great stuff, great individual work. I can't thank, thank crime scene enough for their hard work on that. Had they not uh, slashed their rubbed that knife, we wouldn't have him. You see right where the trailer was? That's where he hit the knife. The one with the right behind that trailer said number one. So it took a little while to find that, but we got it. Murder of three of the trial. Everybody familiar with the case? Three of the trial. Um, we just did an episode on New York Homicide on. And it was probably the most dramatic case I had in my time. And, you know, I talked to other uh, chief detectives who were past and present uh, and said, have you had this in your time? And not many people did. This was a big media case that followed you around. And the thing about a detective, is the difference between a detective and a police officer, and they're both great, they're both heroes. Um, Detectives, their cases stay in their head 24 and 7. They never lose it. And the only way, the only, only time they can lose it is when they solve the case and you still think of it. But in that time, when you're walking around, you're cutting your lawn, you're watching your kids play ball, that's in your head. And it's rolling around what you're going to do the next day. And sometimes you make a phone call, hey, do this, do me a favor, go take care of this, go, don't follow this lead. So that's the difference between a detective and a police officer. Not putting down a police officer at all. Detectives have that in their head, and that's what we're paid to do, paid them to do. So this particular case was a really tough case. Karina was a beautiful woman, as you can see. She was 30 years old in the prime of life. She 
She went out to run every night. She was an avid uh, runner, as was her dad, who was a retired fireman. <clears throat> and they, they would run together um, at Spring Creek Park. And uh, he didn't want to run that night. He says he hurt his knee. He couldn't run. He says, do me a favor, don't run. She says, no, I'm running, Dad. What's, what's what going to happen? She goes out anyway. And she starts running. This is a video. This is an actual video that we, uh, that we recovered from the crime scene as we were looking to see what happened. So she's running, and she doesn't come home. So Phil, her father, gets very nervous. He calls his friend again, Susan Chief, who lives in Hell Beach. And the chief comes over. He starts calling up the precinct, and we get what we call level one. We bring a lot of people in here and search for her body. Phil's out there searching for her, too, because right? he's plugged in. It's getting dark. It's about 6 o'clock at night. It's August 2nd, 2016, 2016. Um, and it's, uh, we're all looking for this girl. He can't, no one can find her. Phil sees a, it's reeds in a park. I'll show you. That's the park, the over, the over thing right there. It's right by Kennedy Airport. Again, the FBI is there. They'll let me have their drones to search for things. Um, and it's a full out of effort. Tough case. Tough case for sure. Um, so we, we find Karina. Phil actually finds her. He runs into the reeds. The, the cops follow him in there. And there's Karina in the, in the, in the, so two, in a situation where it was clear there was a sexual assault. Aside from that, she doesn't have a phone. So the rear buds either. So now I got these eight foot reeds up there. We have to cut down and find those things. So we're in that park. You see where that light is right there. There's a puddle of water, rainwater. It's the only, only water. It's August 2nd. It's hot as, uh, hot as heck. And it's the only water in the place. So does it play a role? Yeah, because Karina's socks were wet. Her shoes were off. Her socks were wet. We couldn't understand it. The only way it could have happened is where this when she got pulled off that path. Is that puddle of water. We start drilling down on this thing. Okay, we got to, uh, we know a little bit more than we did, but we need so much more. Again, the same thing. We, uh, we supplement Queen South Detectives with, uh, with uh, Major Case Unit and other places just to help out, grab anything we can. We develop to develop a DNA profile of underneath Korea's nails. She also has a uh, touch DNA on the back of her neck. And as we drill down on this, this is what we did. This, these are all NYPD police officers going dive to, to the very tough terrain and had kind of weather and that kind of heat. We were out there for eight days, eight days. And um, we were able to find the phone and we got DNA from the phone, touch DNA from the phone, touch DNA from the back of her neck, and now under the fingernails. Again, develop a profile. He's not in COVID. We don't know who he is. We don't know who this guy is. We started drilling. I, I started sending the profile out to Jamaica, you know, West Indies, everywhere I can find that was who's got a DNA profile. Europe, you name it. Put it into poll. See if anybody knows who this individual is. Someone has to know because clearly it was a rape or attempted rape. There's something about rape too that a lot of people don't understand. Um, if um, physically, if you put up a fight, you're going to lose that ability to carry out the rape. Let's put it that way. And what happened was um, Karina fought for her life. She fought like a lioness, but she she took a tremendous beating. And she had her tooth nose knocked out. Dude, he punched her in the face several times. Um, and took a beating and a half. She was all bruised up. It was terrible. There's things that you put out to the press about the incident that you want to hold back. It's called qualifying information. And you want your bad guy to tell you when you lock him up so you know it's him. So that's what we, we didn't put out the wet socks. We didn't put out the, uh, the broken tooth. None of those things. Um, so when we talk to our bad guy, I want him to tell me that. This way I know it's him. There's no mistake. You can't get a false uh, confession, uh, but they, everything has to match up with the physical evidence that you have. Tough, tough case. Um, I, I got to tell you, we're very well supported by the people of Howard Beach. They're bringing water for us. It was a tough, tough eight days. All over the press, international news. Uh, people come to my office said, uh, my cousin just called me. He, he saw you on uh, CNN in, in Europe. He saw you in, uh, um, in, in uh, London. Another person called, they saw you in Italy. So it's, it's a national case. What do people do? Young girls like to go out and run. We had another homicide two weeks after that. Upstate New York, I was in Massachusetts, I think, where she was a New Yorker. Looked at that case, it wasn't the same scenario. So this is the kind of thing kind of going through. It's, it's affecting people's lives and how they go out and how they carry their apple lives. This particular case. I was told by reporters when I saw the case. Um, so, and, but again, what I said before, you always think you can do it, always. DNA. So here's something that I talked about for us before. Uh, it's not exactly what you need, you know, burn in your head. It's tough, it's tough material. You'll see nuclear DNA. Uh, you look at the population, um, nuclear three, 6.80 trillion people, one. It's, I don't think there's that many people on Earth, number one, all right? 
Um, so it's definitely that process in the DNA. Next is, is YSTRs, all right? It ignores the female, it's only male DNA. And then the last is mitochondrial. The reason I bring up mitochondrial is because that's what they have out in um, Hilgo Beach, because the weather um, really derided the, the, the hair strands. They had so much, that's all we can do. And you look, it's one in 5,000, so you're in a different ball game. Yeah, they're in a different ball game, mitochondrial. Usually the court doesn't accept it. Uh, but we'll see how this plays out out east. All right, this is all stuff that uh, we contributed. We had nuclear DNA. We had nuclear, so we had the best profile we could have. John Russo, who works for me, he's a lieutenant, he still works there actually. He lives in Howard Beach. He lives maybe in two blocks away from the sea. He actually knows the family. And he remembers, as we go through this, one of the best cops on the job. He remembers, as he goes through the case, that he stopped someone one time who was looking. We're running with leads. Phil had got a GoFundMe page, and it was like 250 people. And they were all poison pen letters, like my cousin Louie, he's, he's a maniac, he did it. And you gotta go talk to Louie now. And you, how about, uh, you know, Tony, he's no good either. He went out with my uh, sister, I didn't like him. You gotta go talk to Tony now. It's a lot of work, and it doesn't always solve the crime. So, John Russo remembers this guy, young uh, male black, walking through the neighborhood, looking into the backyards. Uh, the 106 precinct, they come over and stop him, and I do. Tells him, and he goes, I just love the neighborhood. Um, I just love the neighborhood, I just want to walk around. So I think nothing to do with, they call a, a, a UF-250, just identify him and he's on his way. John thinks about this and says, you know, he's a weird looking kid, uh, let's take a look at him. So we do. So we send detectives over him to get his DNA. And all the while, I'm thinking, because I'm a seven five guy. Right. And I see that 106 is right next to the 75. So the Bell Parkway next stop is in East New York. It's a wholly different neighborhood than it is in Howard Beach. And we look at the video. We go back to here is the outline of the park. That's the Bell Parkway. When you look at that, all those houses you see at the top of this, they all have home video. He never walks out of that. We grab a video from each one of those homes. He never walks out of that. All right, so you, now you're cutting down. You're trying to come up with a um, hypothesis where he went. All right, so the only place he could have went was it happened right about here, walking onto this bike path towards East New York Brooklyn. So we started looking at this East New York and talking to people there. I know East New York pretty well. Like I said, it's the, unfortunately it's the murder capital of the city. It used to be anyway. Uh, and it's and it's problematic for us. Where does this kid live? He lives in East New York Brooklyn. Okay, let's go and talk to him. Send a team over there. Send a team over there. A uh, young officer, female officer, tremendous. She, she takes the lead. She starts talking him up. She goes, I found I have your DNA. He gives it up. And he goes, I didn't do it though. I think she goes, I know. We'll probably, we'll probably never see me again. We sent it to the lab. And when they called me, they said, we have his DNA. What do you want to do with it? So we're going to send it to the lab right now. Wake, wake up the lab text. Let's see if we get this guy I did. And he goes, well, we don't think it's him. I said, why? He goes, because he's a nerdy guy. He lives in the basement. His mother is nasty. It looks like he's just downstairs all the time. It doesn't look like our guy at all. He goes, he has no friends, nothing like that. Well, I said, now you're talking about it. You just profiled a uh, serial murderer. He said, well, so, uh, let's, let's, let's do it anyway, fellas. Uh, let's just check that uh, DNA. So we got the head. It's him. Hallelujah. Six months to the day of the homicide. Can't thank you, John, so. Um, Chanel was. He tells us that he gives up the whole thing. Most importantly, he says he was angry that day. He gives up the entire thing. People feel sorry for him because he looks like a half horse. He's not, he's a murderer. And he would have kept murdering if we, if we left him out. Simple as that, he had rage against women. Everything starts to line up after we make the arrest. And here's what the important point I want to make. Because you make an arrest, you just have to walk away from the case. You need more work on it, right? a lot more work. So you want to do his phones. What do we do on his phones? His phones, his phones uh, triangulate right to that spot where it happened. Okay, what's up next? We talk to the father. Father tells us, I remember that day, he was jumped by some kids in the park. Really, what happened? Well, he got his hand really bad fighting him off and I had to take him to the hospital. We go to the hospital, get a subpoena, talk to the doctor. They take a piece of foreign material out of his, out of his uh, fist and they throw it out and they, and they give him some, uh, some medication. We believe that foreign matter was coming as two, two wow. to a weekend. All right. So we get all this information start building. We go into his phone where he's running all his um, searches, and we're all over it. 
everything about the case is all over. You're seeing the same thing um, in the Idaho case, uh, Idaho State case. He's following the case on, on video. They're not realizing that when we lock him up. That's all evidence. That's probative stuff right there. Because he's following a little too much. He starts doing searches about his, if he surrenders, what do I got the murder to? How many years? All the things contributing to this individual. Uh, that, that's what you have to do. DNA, pairs if you have them, don't work, and as much as you can. He gives up the entire thing, um, and he actually tells us that exactly explains, like we have we went into the, into the puddle, she lost her shoes, and I dragged her up into the, into the, um, into the reeds, and what, that explains the wet feet. So we have all those things, those are the red tie case. It, in a strange case, it goes to, and I always was afraid it would go on racial lines, to be honest with you, he, he was a young black guy. She was a, a white, a white female, and it did. The mother brought all these people down. These outsiders turned into the first case was a um, was a uh, mistrial. Um, Joe really good judge knew what he was doing. Declared a mistrial, and then we went to the second case. He's convicted of murder too. So that's that's what kind of like your life is. You don't leave it. You stay with it the whole time. Six months. Now I have I've told you, Phil and Kathy. They, if you remember the case, they were very tough on TV. They're not tough. <laughs> Their, their hearts are broken and always will be. Okay. Um, this is something I want to talk about is actionable evidence at a crime scene. Anybody are familiar with the, with the term pocket litter? <coughs> that stuff you throw out at the end of the night in your pockets that you don't want? We don't throw it out. We keep it. We keep those little receipts from Dunkin' Donuts, wherever it is, stuff like that. What happens to Dunkin' Donuts? You go to Dunkin' Donuts, you get a cup of coffee, you're on video. It's good stuff. Thank you. All this stuff. So anyway, this particular case, we have, you have these two individuals, the two professors, the tale of two <coughs> They're both from um, Eastern Europe. They both are teaching um, Yugoslavian uh, history at one of the uh, CUNY schools, at least the fellow on the right was, Bonich was. Um, but he was an adjunct, which if, if you haven't done adjunct professors, I was, you don't make any money. You have to do something else for them, uh, besides being an adjunct professor. So he was that, and they were trying to get uh, a tenure there. So. He told his friend here, Mr. Klinger, um, come to America, send me money, and I'll set you up as a teacher here. I said, as a professor at one of the cubits, John Jay, whatever it was, Baruch, I don't know what they were talking about. And, you, and you'll be a, a history uh, major on uh, your Eastern European history. He lived at, at Rome at the time. So he sends bonus about $50,000. Now, we don't know any of this, right, at the time. We find, we find You see that picture to the right? That's the crime scene. It's January. It's cold, and you're out there. We go into his pocket, and we find a receipt in a bakery. All right, means nothing in and of itself. Maybe go run with it. Go to the bakery now. Go talk to him. See if there's video. See if you can get this guy in video. Sure enough, we see Klinger there that day. In the in the store with Bonich. What are you going to do with it now? Let's talk to Bonich. Let's see. Let let him give us a timeline. Let him tell us what he was doing. And see if it jives what we have here. All right. So it turns out that Bonich uh, tells us that he was in, he didn't see him, never seen him in two days. I don't know what happened to him. Now we find this fellow with two rounds in the back of his head. He's dead, laying up like this on the park. You would think in a park he's walking around, it's a robbery, whatever the case would be, gang related. You don't know. He saw a thing, we said, wait a second, I don't know if this guy's saying he wasn't with him, but you know, it's got a good argument. In fact, so much so. The clerk in the, in the bakery said, he goes, he asked, oh, I was going to ask him to leave, but the argument's over. It's all that. They were arguing about the money that Bonnie should take it from him. He didn't have any money coming over. So that's what precipitated. We go back, we look at uh, Bonnie says, Bonnie says, well, he wasn't staying with me. I don't know where he was staying. We're not that close to friends. Go back in the video across the street from Bonnie's house, and we see Bonnie's about Bonnie's, Bonnie's go out about four o'clock in the morning. He's going to put all this stuff in the garbage can. We come up all that. He lied to us. Big time lies. Many good lies. Uh, bring him back in. He gives the whole thing up for 25 to life. My, my point on this particular case is actual uh, evidence that you find that you got to run with right away. Because you didn't do that right away, that video could be gone in that bakery. It, it recalculates each time. You maybe get 72 hours in if you're lucky on the thing. Important to understand. That's why I talk about faster, stronger, and smarter. But like I said, this is just an assessment. Two ladies find him, two shots in the back of the head, bottom of the stairs in the park, no eyewitnesses, it really nothing. What we used to call in the day a bagger. 
crap. No way you know it. Not so much anymore. You know what you're doing. Find the killer's mistake. They all make them. You gotta find them. It's, just, it's, it's that easy. He's, like I said, he's convicted of murder too. Uh, video canvases, all the facility case. Tough case. He threw the water in the East River. We couldn't find it. Uh, threw the gun in the East River. We couldn't find a gun. So he said it was a special model gun. We couldn't identify the, uh, the, the, the shell that we pulled out of his head. Or the, uh, the, uh, the lead that we pulled out of his head, I should say. Remember Beverly Shapiro? This shows you some really tough work. Detective Steve Smith from Bronx Homicide uh, solved this case, and I still don't know how he did it, but he did. Just by, uh, by one or two, by keep staying with the case. All right. This is Evelyn, 88 years old, less, the less, one of the oldest ladies who lived in the uh, Pelham Bay Parkway house in the Bronx. She's, she's really a tough customer. She was a lot of fun, actually. They said everybody knew her. His daughter said she wouldn't leave the project. She wanted to stay there. That was her home. She's coming back. She has a car with a, with, with a bag of groceries. As she's trying to get her apartment, someone pushes her in and opens her head up with some object that we never find. You know? And so it's extreme head trauma. She's dead there. Police come, we find it, we find the uh, thing at the bottom, the door ajar. We can't get any evidence from the apartment at all. They took her money really quick. It's like something that used to happen in the 70s or 80s when there was a drug robbery. So that's what we thought it was. It has to be a drug robbery. It definitely was a robbery. She had no enemies. Her, uh, all of her jewelry was ransacked, some was taken, some not. And, um, and we couldn't find that either. We put it out on the wanted posters, all kinds of things. So Detective Smith, Tough guy, he stays with the case. He talks to every person arrested for narcotics in the 49th precinct for eight, 10 months. Everyone, he just stands, he goes there every day, works his case, works his case. Finally, he gets someone coming in. This is the house that happened, Elizabeth Rose. He speaks to some people and says, well, yeah, we heard a girl talking that she did it. We figure it out, he, he figured out, he ideas the girl. We go grab this girl, Pia McQueen. Um, she's arrested for possession. When we arrest her, she gives up the murder. Perseverance, endurance, you just keep going. Be strong, strength wise, you just stay with your case. And that's, that's the thing with this particular case. Tina Adebazio. By the way, the area, I, you know, we just go back to Gilgo, I can't because I've been living with it now for, for at least 10 days, I think. Right now. Um, what's, what do you think they're looking for in that house? Do we have any? Uh, Bodies. Bodies, That's trophies. what I used to think. What else? Trophies. Trophies, who said, who said that? Me. What smart person said? <laughs> What, how would you think a trophy is? What would you do in like, life? What would I do? Yeah. You're smart enough to say trophies. <laughs> Here's the thing. You would ask their friends, did, did, did Amber wear any jewelry? Yeah. Mm. Did, did, did um, Melissa Bartholomew, did she have any jewelry? Stuff like that. You want to identify the jewelry she had. That's what I would be doing if I had Gilgo, and I'm sure they don't. You want to go back, they tell you that maybe there was a watch, there was a ring, there was earrings. You go back, maybe there's pictures with those things on. This is what she wore when she went out. See if you can find them in the house. You can find them in the house. You can find that. Good night, Irene. I'd be looking for burlap bags. You could be looking for that too. Was that, did you notice that it was burlap that no one thought it was? It's the duck wine they're off. It's, it's, it's camouflaged. Uh, <coughs> they held that back too, mm -hmm. which is important. They didn't tell us. Everybody, if you remember all the. The, the detective was saying it's burlap from nursery, burlap from clams or some some fishery thing. It wasn't any of those things. Mm -hmm. It was that blue burlap that you do a duck one. Yeah. yeah. You're right, you would be looking for that too. Because they grabbed them out of nowhere. You know, they grabbed them off the street, and that's the best time to grab them because you're going to get a, uh, you know, they had pre indicted him, so he has absolute right to counsel. You can't talk to him when you grab the Rex Hurerman. But if he says something stupid, oh my God, you got me, that's probative. You can put that in court. That's why he grabbed them off the street. Plus, he had all his guns too. So you grab them on the street in Manhattan. You saw what happened. I don't know if you saw the office. Boom, we'll locked them up. Big case. So that helped a lot. So you, when you when you really when you think through your evidence and think through your case, how can I find something when I look for something that, that maybe there may, maybe it's lingerie, maybe it's something that he wanted. All that stuff is probative. You can find it. You now God knows where else. You know, and you have to listen to your neighbors. Your neighbors saw them digging in the backyard. Oh boy, they got dig up the whole backyard, which we've done many times. In Fortunately, in New York City, the backyards are really small. <laughs> it's not a big thing. Uh, but we, 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 do that, we do that all the time as well. And they have new devices they can send something on the ground to. Um, and misinformation comes out. You really don't want to address it because you're just feeding the, the, you know, the craziness now about him and having the, um, if anybody knows that about soundproofing your home, it's not easy to do, it's expensive. Um, these panels are worth it. You go for a lot of money. 
Turns out it was an ultrasound program. But he did have a big bowl for all his cuts and whatever else he had down there. He had a secret life. He was different from the Kohlberger out, out, out west. A totally different guy. Different perp. So he had this raging hatred. Those people are out there. That's why he's a cop. You know, we're gonna be, uh, he was going to find a job somewhere. Uh, matter of Tina out of, out of Algeria. Anybody believe, everybody believe in God here? Anybody not believe in God? I got proof of this guy. I got proof. All right? Um, Tina and Ozzy, a beautiful woman, as you will see. It seems like all the pretty girls get killed in this case, but it's not true. Uh, she's a nurse practitioner, a staff, you know, uh, established woman, lives in the Bronx, 45 precinct. Um, and um, she's going out with an individual. She left her husband for this individual. They since married too. And he's a nurse prac too. Or he's a physician's assistant. They're both physician's assistant. They have good degrees, they have good jobs, they work for the same doctor. They're doing pretty well. Right? The problem is, her new husband is a psychopath. All right. He beats a poor woman all the time. Um, and he was fired from the police department <coughs> beating, beating up women. Each time we call him, he said, two years on the job before I get out. You know, and then he goes back to school and becomes a nurse practitioner or a uh, physician's assistant, whatever he is. It makes, it makes a good living. So it's a tumultuous night. Uh, we put out the missing persons. He, he says she's missing. She walked out. They had a little bit of a fight. She walked out of the house. I haven't seen her since. Oh, my God, my heart's breaking. I know, I'm so with her. But I haven't said anything, well, maybe that's true. Maybe she's, you know, a uh, runaway bride or something, you know. Uh, so you start looking into it more and more. And then you start, you just start, you know, your natural thing is it's the husband. Let's take a look at the husband. Now it pops that he's a, he's a wife beater. That's something here. But they also live with their son. So the son, we're really, he's, he's telling us they were having gone along lately. He's cheating. His name is Eddie Coelho. He's cheating. Um, and, and she caught him, and now there's a big problem here. So we're looking for this girl. So before we jump ahead, we're trying to find out what happened that night. There's a house next door, and there's in that store the guy has a driveway and it's all encased in um, wrought iron because he has a muscle car. He's got a muscle car. It's, it's a beautiful car, and he's got a, a camera right over the top of that car, right? And it's on that car. He's in the bedroom at night. He's looking at make sure his car there, right? You know, it's, it's, not, it's a good neighbor. He's just worried about his car. Uh, and so he put he installed it himself the cameras and he looks at me he's got two cameras outside uh, shows the whole front of his house there's a bad storm that night a bad storm and as Eddie's kills Tina he wraps her up in a bag carries over his neck and he walks to the car puts her in the storm pushes the camera for right over there This, and I asked the fellow, I said, listen, how often those things move? He goes, they never move. He goes, I got them bolted in this. He goes, I can't believe this happened. I said, listen, we need the tape of your uh, thing. So we got the tape. Now we have that. <clears throat> they find Tina's body. Some, some hikers find Tina's body in Westchester County. And we lock up this, this idiot right here. He's doing 25 for life. Um, again, rage, crazy stuff, you know, um, that, that part of the motives that we look at and things of that nature. It's just one of those cases that stick out in my mind because it shouldn't happen. Yes, ma'am. He's at 45th precinct in the Bronx, yes. but not in the street. No. It's the. Are you familiar? That's my where I grew up. Yeah, 45th Bronx. It's, it's the road lot. It's it's in. Um, I'm just like wildly. It's curious. in country club. These names sound familiar, but I'm like, why do I have to? Do it's in I'm it's sorry. in country club. If that helps you. Okay. It's, it's somewhere <laughs> around. It. All right, that's the section of the Bronx. Up there. Um, so um, it happened. I forget what the year was. It was when I was the chief Bronx detective. So it's the type of thing you have to figure out motive and it all comes together really quickly. So we arrested him. Louis Lulu Barbati. I put this out on that. Anybody see, anybody familiar with LB Smoking Gardens? Uh, it's a great pizzeria in Brooklyn. Uh, they sell squares and it's one of the most famous places. It's in Gravesend, Brooklyn. <coughs> so um, Lulu is a, um, there's two families own it. He's Barbati, he's the B. I think it's uh, Luciano or something, it's the L. All right, so everybody goes there. I've been there many, many times, and it, it, it's just it's one of the best pieces you've ever seen. It's Sicilian. So um, you go there, and it's uh, he's the owner, and he's a sweetheart. Everybody knows him, everybody loves him. One night, he's going home. This is Ellen B. Um, it's, it's going home. It starts like in the 1920s, the push cart business. It's a really great American story, and the two families own it. <clears throat> he goes home one night, and they have a split on profits, and he's got cash on him. He's got a cash in him. Uh, bread bag. He's taking home. It's about 17 grand. Uh, they, they split it once a month. Whatever they do, they do. 
So uh, he's got that. He's walking into his house. And he's shot by this male here. Several times, unloaded in the back. Shot, shot about six times in the back and he dies. So he's screaming. He's trying to get home through to that, to that, uh, to that door there. I don't know if I have that there. No, no. He's trying to get home through the door. And he can't get through and he ends up dead by a false up. Now we got, if you know Stony Gardens, it has some, some historical mob significance in Philly history. They're hardworking people. Whenever you talk about pizza and food in New York, the mob really comes in right after that. It's not true. It's not, this is, these are good, hardworking people. They had nothing to do with the mob. They had a secret sauce recipe. It gets really crazy. <laughs> and so we have to run with that. But if you look at these cases, think about what you're doing if you're a detective, right? You can't let a lawyer bring that up in court. Because he's going to come up with that. If he's defending his client, when you do get the guy, he's defending his client. And he's saying, well, uh, you know, the mob did it. You've got to shut that out so he can't say that. So you have to have answers for everything. And so that's what we did. We went, so we kept the case going for a while to make sure that this wasn't any, anything to do with the, with the American mafia. I hate the word mafia. It's a mob organized crime. All right. Uh, so one of the things we saw was the killer on a on video, uh, of a neighbor's video. Now, it's Steiger Heights, so a lot of people there are, are well aware of Lulu, well aware of the, of the mob influence in the area. So they're really helping us, but they're not helping us, they're not telling us a lot. But we got that guy. We think he's our killer. We get some cigarette butts on the thing, we, we look at that, it wasn't that, he wasn't smoking. It was someone else, it was the neighbor. We grab the neighbor, he goes, I listen, I don't tell my wife I smoke, don't tell her either, but I smoke, <laughs> I do I say, okay, it's not you. So this is, um, we get his picture, and you look at the video, of that video, that clip, whatever it is, and you look at it at least a dozen times, each time. It's a little different, it's a little weird. Now you see it's weird, it's, 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 it's uh, in June, it's hot, and he's got a uh, sweatshirt on. And I tell you, this is one of the dumbest criminals I've ever met. Dumb, and thank God they're dumb. He's out there, he's walking around out there, and we think that maybe he's got tats, maybe he's hiding something, because he's wearing that thing in the middle of, of the middle of summer. So, we put it out in a video, and it's really not great video. I have another case I want to talk about too. You put this thing on a video, somewhere, somewhere, somehow knows this guy. So we're watching it and watching it. And we got a phone call. A woman calls. She goes, That's my husband. Okay. How do you know it's your husband? Did you notice did you notice that he limped? Like this. No one knew it. Because unless you watch it twelve times, you don't realize he's got a little bit of a limp. Oh what the heck. So tell us more. She goes, he's no good. He's a gambler. Now, Lulu was a gambler too, but Lulu was a gentleman gambler. He just went to the track and with his buddies, that's all he did. This guy was heavyweight. You know, uh, went to Atlantic City, all kinds of things. So we're looking at him, and we still have to figure out how does he know Lulu was having money that day? Guess what? We never found out. We never found out. But she identifies him. So we do his phone. Right there. That's him. We do his car. We know it's a TL, an actor of TL, but we don't know who's in it. It's a white TL. And it's got a. Uh, one of those Christmas tree uh, things hanging from the thing that the fresh right. He's got that too. So this is all we know now. That this, this is our guy. He goes back on the on the, on the Bell Parkway to Long Island. He was out in the island somewhere. And so that's all we have with the TL. And we call up the wife and say, "How did he get the TL?" And so she said he got an injury. The reason he limps, he lost a toe in a construction accident, and um, he got like a settlement for like ninety thousand dollars. Bought the thing. He's in, Wasted all away at the casinos. They didn't give me a penny. Or the baby. They have a baby. Okay. So then we get other calls. Saying that's, it. that's uh, Tony Fernandez, Andy Fernandez. I went to school with him. And then my PD inspector comes walking and closes the door. So he goes, I know that guy. It's Fernandez. That's him. So we go to the uh, FBI. We want to clear to see if there's any uh, mob influence. There wasn't. But still, it takes time. We go out to his house to lock him up. Dumb guy. We go in there to lock him up. The detective, that's Jimmy Hemmer there, the, uh, the handsome guy in a long coat, he, uh, he, he goes into his wallet, and what does he find? He finds Louis' address on a card in his wallet. Thank you very much. Walk, walk him in the federal court. Again, a thug. He's like 6'3", you know, like rangy type of guy. Um, 25 to life. Mistakes. Find the mistakes. In that particular one, you had to know who the person was first, the wife. Was the, there's a pivot in each case. There was a pivot over here with the car. There's a pivot with the, um, with the DNA out in uh, Idaho State. 
And once you identify your curve, everything just falls in place. Because you're making a cake. It's going to know what cake you're making. That's what I want. Uh, so, this is Imam Alanji Kanji, homicide. Him and his friend are walking uh, after a. Uh, he's an Imam in, in a local uh, temple, they're Muslim. Uh, and it's, uh, I forget where they were from, the, the community goes in the wrong six. And he's walking, and someone comes up and puts two rounds in the back of his head. Kills them both, execution style. You know, now it's, it's a problem. These people are really upset that they killed their imam and they should have been. But I'll tell you, they all look like a lot of people, they could have been nice. Nice people. That confidence in, in us that we're going to solve the crime. It really drives you when someone has confidence. They're sweet people. Um, and so, big, big funeral for him, all kinds of things. The perp who shoots him jumps into a black SUV and takes off. That's all we have. Not even a partial plate, we got nothing. Lenny Schulman, first grade detective from um, Queen's Health Homicide. This is a new database that runs every car they needed at that day. So we find out there was a hit and run on, on Sutter and Miller Avenue in the 75. Again, 75 is right next door. And, um, and they got the plate. And we run the plate to be our guy. Because we have a picture of him walking with the head of the And we also have a sketch of the guy. So we got, we got, some, we got some, um, some, some good stuff. We go to the house, we, we look up in the house, and there's the SUV out front. It looks like the, exactly the same vehicle. I forget what it was. It was a Chevy something, or a Chevy GMC. And we look at it, and it's the house. We set up on the house. We start doing our due diligence. We find a picture of him. That's him. Sketches matter. Uh, so it's old time policing, and you go with new time with data, data searches. It all works together. This is uh, Omar Morell. He, he, it was a weird thing. We, we went through all of them. We thought it was an anti-Muslim thing. We couldn't find anything that he was anti-Muslim. It is on his phone with all the searches. They were like an idiot search. You know, I, I hate to use that word, but it was, uh, it was all like silly stuff for a man his age you shouldn't be looking at. Uh, it was like stuff like that. There's nothing I could pin to this guy at all that we were able to pin him out. He never makes a, st a statement to us. He gets some, some lawyer, uh, an 18B lawyer, and he gets convicted, and he's doing 25 to life. A week later, this woman's walking down the street. This was the summer of 16. I didn't sleep much that summer. Uh, and this, this lady, Rita Nazma, she is stabbed in her heart one time and killed as she's walking to her house. She was a doctor in her country. I, I, um, forget, I forget the name of the country. I think it's Bengali, which is where she came from. Um, she was stabbed as she was walking home. Her husband, who's <coughs> not as agile as her, not as quick as her, he's walking maybe 30 feet behind. Guy walks up. Stabs her one, one time in the heart and takes off. Again, the same thing, the same exact thing. People are wondering, these folks wondering what's going on. This is famous as you want at the mosque. What's going on? Why is, what's happening to our people? It's not right. Great. Again, it was sweet. I said, if you find both of these cases, just, just give, me, give me a couple days. So, what you do is you go to the scene again and again and again. There was nothing here, no one could ID him. The only thing we had was a video of him running away. Here's the video of him running away. Better call stuff. Anything distinguishable there? Jeremy, three stripes, right? Three stripe uh, Adidas. That's all we have. Male Spanish, that's all we have. Sports sports sneaker, that's all it's all we have. Ray Munoz, first grade detective, goes back to the scene of his partner and they sit out there and they see those sneakers walk by him there. Looks very nice later. Hey, can we talk to you for a minute? And they start talking to him. Guy just got in the country. From, like, from somewhere in South America, it was a cook, hated his life in America, worked at the party, thought he would come here and make millions. Uh, and he was getting very agile, he was a robber. And she wouldn't give the money up, he stabbed him in the heart. That's what happened. Um, these are some of the things you do as you go forward in life. Um, you look for little things, and you make them big things, you turn them into habits. That's my, my presentation today. And let's, let's talk about some cases. Anybody have any questions? I'm very interested in the in the people and a very unique peop, um, people that hone in on certain aspects and they keep going back into I, I see it on TV they keep going back to certain things DNA family history and things like that and then they um, they um, find a relative that might have that DNA and they match things up and they sure. eventually 
eventually put things, it's like a puzzle, it's so interesting. You're talking about familiar DNA searches. I will tell you, they weren't allowed to work. <coughs> I'm sorry. Familial DNA searches. So you can go into one of the, um, I don't know, I, I, with Ancestors.com, I can trace my Irish roots back to Donegal. I, and I like it, it's a lot of fun. You know, 21 of me, whatever things are. And you go in there, you take that DNA, you put it in there, and you find yours. It doesn't always work that no, way. That's what you got to do it anyway. It doesn't always work that way. So you hopefully find, I'll tell you what, we found, uh, we got a woman washed up the shores of, uh, um, in South Brooklyn. And all we had was a tattoo. She was dismembered from the death server that we had a tattoo. And we use hard, hard uh, isotope things. We'll tell you what part of the country she's from. There's a lot of things, science you can do with these things. But we did familial DNA. Um, and we find out who she is, right? Identify, identify her. We thought her name was something else, and the first letter was was missed, was, was actually taken from, a, uh, obviously, from a fish that bit her. So the first letter on the tattoo that she had. We know who it was. She also had her son's name tattooed. So we, this, these are names we didn't know what it was. And I, I forget what her name was, but it was it was it was really close to what we thought it was. And um, so we asked questions. We found out their cousin. They go, oh yeah, that's missing. Um, I forget her name, Angel, let's say. Um, and so uh, yeah, so we hooked up, and we thought she ran away, and that was the end of it. And this is the girl. Yeah, she had a lot of problems with her boy, though. So we got her. Wow. So it does work. It doesn't always work. But doesn't mean you don't stop. You should, you should do it. We had to fight to get the. You know who who actually testified to get that done? Bill uh, Vachana. He wanted to do something for his daughter that the people remember what. So he went to Albany and got it passed. So we do that all the time now. You know they did that out here too. That's how they found one of the girls was Valerie Mack. I don't know if anybody's been following the case. Yeah. She's one of the ladies there. And um, and so that's how they identified her. Through that, through that process. No one even knew Valerie was missing. She was never reported missing. So we, even if it wasn't in our data files, when you think about it. Now her, what's interesting about Valerie, she she messed up to Jessica Taylor, also missing out there. Jessica Taylor, they, they, the different parts of both girls' bodies were found in Gilgal and Manorville. That to the, to itself is a pattern. Both of them were sex workers. All right, both of them were missing about the same time. I think we got another part about that. It's not I'm also curious about the um, uh, evidence that you collect, and it goes into, let's say, forensic uh, lab uh, pathology. Where is where is that located? Is it located in Suffolk County, or is it John Jay? Where, wherever their OCME is. That profile is then downloaded into CODIS, and it stays there. A CODIS is, uh, I forget what it is. It's a, it's a database for DNA talking. profiles. Yeah. That's what that is, and that's how you solve crime. Everybody who goes to jail, prison, has to go with the codes. So if there's an old crime there, that's how you solve crimes. Mm -hmm. Anytime we, we do uh, cold case work, uh, you look for instances where persons were close to each other when they died. Either stabbing or, or, uh, yeah. or choking or something like that, you have a better chance of, of solving that crime. Anybody else? I know Keep this going. Is, I don't, <laughs> well, um, there's a lot of problems with M, I think it's M13, and there was just a- M13. Uh, supposedly, yeah. yeah. You're not involved in any, I think, thing like that, are you? No, I'm not, yeah, no. No, that's <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you could have said it louder. I didn't hear it, so. No, it's, uh, <laughs> MS13 is a very big profile in the right here in Southern County. Um, and you know, the thing is, they're, they're small lads, they're not very big. Uh, but they're dangerous to each other. Oh, yes, they are. They're dangerous to uh, each other. And uh, Bugsy Siegel once said, why are you bothering us? We only kill, we only kill other mobsters. And that's their attitude. We kill all the other people, you know, uh, yeah. they're not going to do it. But they don't do well in jail either, this one. Um, so it's... Uh, in what way do you mean? They're, they're not physically big. Jail, know, they're jail not can be a fight every day. Oh, see. So they're not big, so they have, they have to cluster together. But they're very organized. They're very vicious. Yes, they are. And they are in Suffolk County more than they are in the city. We had one, what they call click. Uh, that was in Jamaica, Queens. Well, we have them. They, 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 they beef against the Latin Kings, and we like them up for it. But it's not the same here. There's more here. But it seems like they're, they're let's say, exonerated or whatever, and then sent back to their country. They come over the border again. This is what I'm reading. Five years. I'm sorry. You, at one time in America, if you violated our laws, you went to jail. So if you're a re illegal reentry, you're, 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 you're deported, you come back, you have to do five years federal time. I don't know what's going on, to be honest with you. I don't know what the feds are doing. I, I know ICE is, is a great organization. I know they want to do their job.
But uh, to answer your question, is once you're deported, if you come back in a legal reentry, you're going to jail for five years. That's what it used to be. You know, and that's, that's been like that for 15, 20 years. It hasn't been any of our new presidents telling us. It's been a while. It's been a while. But uh, so, you know, that's, that is, it's kind of like a small scale issue for me in the city. I had a lot of gangs. You usually figured out how, how we start taking down gangs more and more. With our they are vicious. vicious. And they use the machetes very well. They do. Here's the thing with gang members. Um, it's like domestic violence. It, it steals kids from their family and puts them in a gang life. And that's why you have to go hard. You have to shut them down. Otherwise, the will, if to join a gang, you have to commit a crime. And that's, and that's what they'll do. And so to save a kid from a gang life is to get rid of the gangs. Or at least keep them in jail. Keep them, I'll let them know that we're watching them put them in jail. We did, I think, 115 gang takedowns in one year. And that's what dropped the, the murder. Uh, yeah. below 300. At one time, it was 2,200 murders plus in 1993, I think it was. Um, and um, we dropped that number down to less than 300. It was 280 or something. And, and that's how low it got. Uh, and now it's up to 400, 500 again. So we're going in the wrong direction. Yeah, right. Uh, enough politics. What's going on with that? Yeah. Anybody have any questions about DNA? Fingerprints are still a must. We still do it all the time. These are forensic science. Yes, ma'am. How do you use uh, dental records? Is there like a massive database? No, there isn't. Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> because uh, if you have someone missing, the detective in that case should get a hold of those in case the body's found elsewhere. Uh, go find and a lot of people don't have dentists, to be honest with you. you know, poor people don't have the, the, the dental uh, uh, abilities that we, we do. Uh, but that's one thing to look. Um, and if the body's found, we and we'll look through dental records they do have on file to see if it's them. Now this HIPAA laws you just can't say give everybody give, it, give me everybody's dentist records. It doesn't work that way. Oh, that's yeah. including the HIPAA. Yes. So <clears throat> you you do want if you have a missing person case and you don't have them and it gets really bad. And we have them in this country. You should be able to get their, their dental records and put it in the case file, or at least know where the dentist is and tell them to hang up the records. I mean, do something of that nature. Give them a subpoena and and, and hold it. Good detectives will do that because they're, they're going to pop up somewhere, you know, because you don't know where they are. You see, there was a case of a Long Island girl, Gabby Petito, if you remember that case, mm -hmm. oh, uh, yeah. killed by her boyfriend. Pretty easy case to solve, but um, she was put out in, in an extreme um, environment that, that she started to decompose quickly. So um, that could have happened there. You didn't know what it was. There was no circumstances, which we kind of like to know what it was, uh, but if you dump, if you give to dispose of a body someplace uh, in those environments. And it did happen in Gildo, because we lost that strands of hair um, to, to deride it into, from nuclear to uh, mitochondrial uh, because they were out in the elements. So that's something to think about too. Um, dental records, well, they, they remember that some of these girls were never even, we were never even uh, described as missing. Um, I find that the Har uh, Harriman uh, case is interesting. Which case? And I know um, one, Rex Harriman, yeah. that we're just talking sure, about, is, is interesting and it's not, I'm sure it's not completed and they're not telling the, um, you know, the public any, any information. But there was something said about a blonde, a couple of blonde strands of long blonde hair that were found in the rack, um, the um, um, burlap. And so they think that maybe, maybe you can't answer any of these questions, but they think that maybe he had a, he had an accomplice. Uh, in my mind, I'm thinking that the per first of all, could the wife really live there with her kids in that house? It's such a dump. But um, could she have been an accomplice or her daughter? Because they were all all that blonde hair, and I was just curious about it. And it's still an ongoing thing. And, there's nothing proper. First of all, <clears throat> the house wasn't disarranged. I'm sure I'll take it to some place in the Brooklyn, much worse than that. Uh, so it's it's it wasn't. There's you nothing to say that, that they, they did they did it together. You know, his his thing was an adult thing he did, right? They make mistakes. As long as you know, it's hard to believe that he can get along that that long. He had burner phones, right? Where do you keep your phones? If you're a man, you keep them on your laptop, right? And if you have, do you ever see people walk with two or three phones my whole time? It's not unusual. <clears throat> where they keep them right next to each other. So that burner phone that they found out where it was, right, they did a, a triangulation on that phone 
in his personal bonds, phone that he didn't have a record record for the whole time. We say the business stood us. Stood us. But he you know, he thinks he can get away with it. He's smarter than everybody. He you know? did. He had an attitude. He, he did, and they do, and they, and usually it's a superior attitude. You saw him talking on that thing. By the way, I thought he was a narcissist. How how, how important he was. And he needed that domination, I felt. You know, because then he got from these girls to, to support that uh, narcissist. Yeah. But I don't think his wife was involved. It, her hairs were there, that's transfer DNA. He had used something there and her hair was on it. That's how they did the garbage collection at night. So what do they do? You send a cop plain clothes with his dog, he walks by, steals the garbage and runs. All right, that's how it works. And then you use the garbage. Once you put it out, it's gone. So it's in the public domain, it's not yours anymore. So you can use that. Great case, a lot of work on it. It really was. I still think the Idaho State case is even better. <laughs> yes, sir. The, uh Suffolk County uh, Police Commissioner at the time, he was going through a lot of problems. Do you think that contributed to the case taking as long as it is to solve? It's a good question because I actually knew that commissioner. I didn't know him well. Um, he took the feds off the case, if you remember. They were on initially. The feds gave you those two boxes mm -hmm. that you had, um, and they didn't handle the boxes very well. You had Manhattan, which is tough, it's tough terrain, and you had Mesquite Park, not so tough. Um, but they had, feds gave them that on the triangulation, they just couldn't go any further because they were burner phones. So had that happened, if they wouldn't have taken the feds off, had, could have kept them on board. And, I, and he fired all the feds. And listen, it's a, it's, it's a mess, what, ha what happened with that, with that uh, chief of police there. But um, it, it could have impacted in those respects, could have gotten there sooner. We don't know if, if Howard been killed again. Uh, we're trying to find that out right now. He was a sick pup and he's got all that crazy Pornography that he had, torture pornography, child pornography. He's a strange dude. So, and they found that. They went into his home and they, they found his phony uh, emails. From those emails, he was posting pictures. And you can you can have an agent or an analyst, I should say, pull a, pull a phone from that picture. It's great stuff. How did they get it the first time for the uh, FBI to determine which locations? Did they have his burner phone? They had a burner phone, phone because the burner phones was calling the girls right before they went dead. So he had seven burners. <coughs> And they were able to track those burner phones right away at the location? Yeah, they had the numbers. They knew they the burner phones, they tracked them that way. For the cell tower in that area? Yes. Okay. And they knew it was a mess before. Okay. So it's, it came together, they had a lot of it going on. Um, it should have probably gone on quicker. But uh, it's uh, sometimes it's politics come into, uh, into, your, you know, into the case too. And, uh, so it stops you from doing, doing your job. They should have had this guy over on water. And I hate to say it about law enforcement because I'm a 35 year member of it. But, um, you know, Harrison, all respect to Rodney, did the right thing. Put that together, that that task force with all those different units there. And that, that it's what they ran on that, on that uh, car was called a lawman search. We've been doing that for years. That'll give you all the cars in, in, in Nassau, Suffolk County that fit that, that, uh, that vehicle. When did that, do you have an idea when Chief Harris started that uh, process? Yeah, January, uh, <coughs> excuse me, February Because he's been in office there for a couple of years already, right? right. He's been, I guess, or coming in Suffolk. Harrison? Yeah, has been about a year and a half? No, this guy hired him immediately. Him and the new mayor of New York. Uh, no, I know, I got it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he went out there. Right. So, and, that, and that's how that happened. I thought he was out there a couple of years already. No, no, there was, there was, a, there was an FBI agent, Terry Hart, there. Okay. Can't place the out there. She actually followed the case. She brought the feds back in, but they didn't have that aha moment with the car, which changed everything. Got it. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Why is it that they don't think he did all of those? <sighs> you need evidence to show that, and it's different to what he did. He put those four ladies in the same barrel, almost right next to each other, right? And they're all, if you remember, they're all under five foot. So they were they were slight ladies, except for the one. Um, Megan Waterman was like five, three or five, four. Um, the others were under five foot. So he oh, had a specific guy. What's that? No, it was him. It was it because he, he had them all in the same umbrella. No, but I mean, if there's nine or ten more bodies out there, is that a copycat? Or no, a I, it's difficult to say that. I don't want to say no. It's say no, absolutely not, because I don't know. But I will tell you that we have um, what we call open graveyards all over the city as well. We have them in East New York and, and uh, along the Bell Parkway. They're usually mob pits where they, they, they put a bullet in someone's head and they kill them out when you live in there. Uh, so they, there's the places where they dump bodies. Um, I, I tell you what, uh, Ocean Parkway, I used to race my cars down there. <coughs> when I was younger. And um, no one's out there. Uh -huh. 
No, we got there early in the middle of winter. Exactly. No it's it's no. under the guise of the um, state police. That's why they were on board, and because they were on board, the new detective from the state police was able to find out where that car was. He had two, by the way, two avalanches. A, a grid search would have found it. A grid, a grid search would have found it. So these are errors. Um, leadership matters in these things. Uh, people who can work with each other, those things matter as well. So uh, that's, that's all important to realize, too. Is that you want to put the team in, and you don't want egos, you don't want all those things, you just want work. And they, he had his subject identified, I think about a month and a half into the case, which is mess. Good stuff. And they kept it quiet, which is even more important. What else? I don't dare. <laughs> she came here. We got, uh, she's got a lot of questions. I'm worried about her. No, she's watching. She's watching. She's watching. You should ask questions about forensic sciences because I tell you, I said, what I said I'm before. Very interested in it. So. You need grasp. You don't have to be a molecular biologist to figure it out. But if you understand it, that we do have people who can do that for you. you know, but you have to have grasp. You have to know what you want when you ask for something. Those, those strands of here matter. You know, those, those victims matter. You know, they're, they're, they're only going to pile up if you didn't stop him. I really, there's a strong chance that he killed those people in that house. At least one or two. If you look at the court, coincides, his wife leaves. That's another reason why we didn't think it was a wife. His wife goes away. Every time he goes away, this goes over. Yeah, but wife comes back and she sees stuff. You can't, you know. <laughs> I can, I'm not going to talk you off that hill, but that's fine. I, I really don't think, if you saw her, uh, I, I, I actually it felt bad for her. She looked like she was at lost and she was the whole world was crashing on her. So it's, you know, he, he, was a, he was a double life guy, which we have, which we have, and that's what he was, he was killed. I, I, I say it all the time, I think the Idaho, Idaho State case is equally intriguing in every way, because um, they put together that case and they had him ID, and uh, it was a great job, it really was. And he was the weird anti-social guy. But the, 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 um, FBI was less Why well, do you think they waited so long to on that car ride? Because he's from Idaho to was it Pennsylvania or wherever he put his dad to do the DNA. So when you stab someone like that, uh, or, more often than not, actually it happens a lot. You're such in a fury that you'll cut your own hand. You know, your hand will, will slide on the knife. At some point, you'll cut your hands. If you remember the the, the phone they had, they wanted him. Uh, they want to see his hands. And they went from the other side and they were able to see his hands. First thing we, we do, when we have a stabbing thing, we take pictures of the hands. See if they're bruised at all, see if they're cut at all. And more often than that, they are. At that time, they had him on the deep surveillance. They had this guy on the deep surveillance too, uh, Ehrman. Because um, you can't, he can't walk outside and go kill somebody that's on you. You gotta, you gotta follow him. You gotta have the agents in the field, people in the field following him at all times. So they were following him at that point he had switched the car at that point, and so that was also indicative of, uh, of, of he was the guy. And they wanted to go back to the parents' house and get the DNA from him from the garbage can. There was a lot of similarities and a lot of differences between the two cases, but they pulled garbage on his Pennsylvania house once he was there. The guy's DNA. He was a, uh, I think he was going for a PhD mm -hmm. in criminology. It just goes to show you that uh, you can be as smart as anybody and you can still make mistakes. Still end up that. And they have more than we, we know that they have, by the way. This hasn't been put out. They ran a very tight case. There's a lot of case discipline on that, and that's what happened. There's nothing else. I'm good. I stopped raining. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got a good sunset. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you all for coming. I hope you learned something tonight. Um, uh, you can please watch 